So uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I am Fabiano Fidencio. I am a software engineer who works for Intel as part of the Cloud Hypervisor and Kata Containers team. Uh, I'm here today to talk a little bit about, uh, well, Kata Containers, just go through this quite quickly. Uh, the confinement work that we have done because this talk uh, is confining the extra security layer, so we are going to go through the how we got Kata Containers to properly behave using SA Linux. Uh, what is still missing? The benefits to the community, and we're going to do a quick recap. I must tell you, like, I have a lot of slides. So I may not be able to actually get uh, to the Q&A here. I'm going to have to speak quite fast, but I will be here outside uh, so we can just chat there. Don't worry, you're not going to be running. You cannot run anymore. So, uh, Kata containers. Uh, I guess the, the best way to start talking about Kata containers is start talking about traditional containers. Uh, is everyone here familiar with traditional containers and Kata containers? OK, so cool. Traditional containers are pretty much like a process running uh, atop of the host Linux kernel, and they are confined by C groups, uh, namespaces, and they can have sometimes like um, mandatory access control, which a bunch of people just disable it. Uh, and they can have, uh, they can be like less privileged or more privileged like, uh, according to capabilities and seccomp. Kata containers is pretty much the same thing, but we provide an extra hardware virtualization layer where you can actually run the, your container process inside. So uh, on the case here uh, on the right, if there is an escape, you are pretty much <laughs> uh, on the host Linux kernel. Like you can do pretty much whatever you want if this is not uh, confined by some mechanism like uh, SA Linux. On the Kata containers though, like if you, if you have an escape, you are inside that really, really lightweight virtual machine. And the only thing you can see there are the resources that were allocated specifically for your pod. So you, you cannot mess around with different processes unless you are able to also escape the virtual machine, which is like, well, good luck. Uh, OK, how Kata containers actually works. Uh, folks here are familiar with Kubernetes. OK, Kata Containers, since the version 2.0, is quite tailored to Kubernetes. We don't have uh, Docker or, or Podman support anymore. And how it works on the Kubernetes side, you have like the kubelet daemon running on a node. A user creates a pod. Kubelet receives, receives a request. Then it will just pass the request down to the CRI engine, which is either cryo or containerd. Uh, and then it will start the container dish in Kata v2. This uh, long name is the name of the Kata runtime. I will interchangeably say a container edition Kata v2, Kata shin, Kata runtime. It's the same thing, okay? Uh, Kata runtime then uh, we will start the VMM process. And on Kata containers, we have support for, well, we actually test on RCI three different VMMs KMU, which is, I guess, everyone's familiar with. Uh, it was the first one that we started using. Uh, we have support for Firecracker, which relies on Rust VMM. And we also have support to Cloud Hypervisor, which is a project from Intel, from my team, which is also based on Rust VMM, but it's like really, really tailored for, tailored for the cloud use cases. OK, uh, got a runtime, starts the VMM process. The VMM process will actually like have the guest up, Inside the guest, we have a init process that is the agent, and the agent is responsible for the lifetime of the containers. Uh, you have to share content between the host and the guest. You have to share the container root FS. So you have, if you have volumes, if you are mounting volumes, those have to be shared between the host and the guest. There are two ways to do that. Well, the first one is using a uh, device mapper. So you can just attach uh, Virtual block or a virtual device there, 
or you can use something like Virtio FSD or Nidus D, which is like a shared file system protocol that can just like allows you to do that. Uh, Virtio FSD started as a replacement of the old 90PFS, which we all hope that stays as dead as it is nowadays. Uh, so, enough talk. Let me show you uh, a little bit of what I've been telling you. Here I have a Kubernetes cluster running with Cryo as the CRR engine, and I'm going to start two uh, Nginx containers. The first one is going to run with the default runtime uh, using the Nginx image. The second one has this. The main difference here is this runtime class name, which is just telling me like I'm going to use the Kata containers runtime uh, with the KMU as VMM. So start both pods. They are both running. Uh, let's actually check that they are behaving as, as expected. So the first one, well, for both of them, we're just going to check that the Nginx server is up. Uh, works very well for the run CKs, which is the default uh, container runtime, and also works very well for the Kata containers. Now, let's take a look at the processes that are running on the host side. Uh, let me just go back here. We have the Kata runtime process. We have uh, Virtio FSD that I mentioned for sharing the file systems between the host and the guest. And we have KMU. So those are the processes that are running on the host side, and those are the processes that can, if there is an escape, are through those that an attacker can, could actually have access to our host. So we have to combine them better. Uh, what is the best way to get a process that we see here that is running as root? Because rootless Kubernetes is still not a thing yet. They are doing good progress. But what is the best way to confine a process that is running as root to not have access to other content? SA Linux. Uh, so what is SA Linux? There is this, uh, Red Hat has this really nice definition uh, in their, their web page. They say like, ah, this is uh, security enhanced Linux. Uh, and it says it was started by NSA, uh, got to the Linux kernel in 2003. So you know this is a quite mature project uh, and quite well developed project. And it has been. Uh, expanding since it started to accommodate new technologies, which is amazing. Uh, I like the definition, though, from uh, Lucas Vrabetz from Red Hat, who says that SA Linux is a technology for process isolation to mitigate attacks via privilege escalation. How does it do it? I guess uh, the main thing we have to understand here is the difference between mandatory access control and discretionary access control. DHC is what we have with like any Linux system. We have a file. You can set who owns the file, the permissions on that file, and that's pretty much it. But we have a problem. Imagine that I have a file, that I have a read-only file that can only be accessed by, by the user Fabiano. But someone breaks into, machine, into my machine, gets uh, root access to that, they can simply change the permissions. They can ch simply change the ownership. They can access the file. They can do whatever they want. Uh, with um, mandatory access control, this is slightly different. Because uh, MAC, it actually defines uh, access controls for the applications, processes, and files on the systems. So it basically defines uh, the interactions that a process can have with the other things that you have uh, running on your host side. It uses a set of rules of what can or cannot be accessed. We call those policies. And when a process requests access to an object, the permissions are checked, and then it will be denied or, or granted. So with SA Linux, you may be root. You may try to access a file that has like 777 permissions, right? And if 
your process is not labeled correctly, you will not get access to that. You'll just get a permission denied. So this is what we want to ensure. So in order to ensure this for Kata containers, a new policy uh, had to be created. Uh, we have uh, Dan Walsh from Red Hat, as known as uh, Mr. SA Linux, uh, <laughs> created this policy uh, called Container KVMT. And the whole idea is we get the container T policy, which is what containers should be using, which is a very, very restrictive policy. And we expand this a little bit to allow whatever uh, a VMM and virtual UFSD have to do in order to actually be able to use Kata containers. Uh, a container, uh, the container T uh, label can actually access all the things that are container file T label. So everything that is inside the container, and if a container breaks out, it will just get blocked. Because if it tries to write anything on slash root, slash USR, slash var, it has no permissions to do so. However, it can still like read and, and execute binaries from slash USR because you know uh, it's interesting for you to actually create a, a pod where you can actually link a binary from, from your host to inside the container. Uh, the problem is hypervisors and shared file systems, uh, they need different access. If you are thinking about a hypervisor, it has to somehow have access to TunTap devices in order to pass this to the guest side and then we can have connectivity inside the guest. Uh, VirtioFS, it has to mount uh, directories volumes uh, on the host side. And we don't want, we really don't want the, the normal container T label to be able to do so. So instead of like actually expanding the container T, the decision was create a new container KV, KVMT type. And mind, this is way more restrictive than just the VM normal label. Because it was going in the opposite direction. We got the containers and just tuned that to what we need for, for Kata containers. And we hope that this would work out of the box for all VMMs and shared file system solutions. We were wrong. <laughs> uh, so anyways, uh, this was introduced. Uh, the most part of the work done on this front, uh, there were two projects there. Container SA Linux, which is the policy. So Dan Walsh added the new policy there. And then we have the SA Linux library for Go. And we had to add the support to actually checking the correct file, see if the label exists on the system, and then actually properly pass the label, set the label to the process. So those two projects were involved there, and then we wanted to have this actually working as part of Kata containers. So the approach taken was we should receive a label from the upper process. So the CRI engine should be the process that should actually tell me, as the container runtime, I want this label, I want you to spawn uh, the VMM and the virtual UFSD process with this label. And we pass it down via the OCI spec. So Dan Walsh, again, did the majority of the work here. I was pretty much only taking care that we were setting uh, the label in the correct parts of cut containers. Then I started working on the cryo support, because if you want to have this running on OpenShift, OpenShift uses Cryo, we have to have it running with Cryo. Uh, the Cryo support was added by Urvashi, but there was a small mistake there. She added this when we were creating the container, and we create the container already inside the virtual machine. We, we don't care about this being like confined inside the virtual machine. We want this to be confined on the host side. And I end up doing the changes there to just set uh, the label on the OCI spec uh, by the time you are creating the sandbox. So it gets to, go to the cutter runtime, and then it will be able to actually spawn everything with the right label. So let me just show you. Uh, this is, I'm not going to go and run the whole demo game, because it's exactly the same recording. <laughs> 
I have the links for that. It's exactly the same recording. This is just the second part of the recording. Uh, I'm just going to show you here that the first demo I run with SA Linux uh, set as enforcing. SA Linux has three modes. Disabled, don't do that, please. Uh, permissive, that is like, you can run everything, but you're going to complain about that. We're going to log all the errors. And enforcing, which is like, if there is an error, I'm just going to block it. So everything was running as enforcing. And here you can see the label of the process. So we have the virtio FSD here. Uh, is that it? Yeah. Virtual FSD here, and this is running as the container KVMT. Uh, Virtual FSD, and the same about KMO. But Cryo is not the only CRI engine that we, are, we have interest on. We have ContainerD. ContainerD is by far the most used CRI engine out there. And does it work? <laughs> there is only one way to know, right? I, this is again like Kubernetes cluster using CentOS and I'm gonna do exactly what I did before. I'm gonna start the Nginx uh, pod using Kata Containers Runtime class with the KMU as VMM. Uh, apply the pod, take a look that it's up and running. Uh, let's check that everything is actually working as expected. And then let's check the process labels. And, oh boy. So you can see here, the Virtio FSD is running with the container runtime T label. It's not the container KVMT. Uh, it's actually the same label that the <laughs> Qatar runtime is using. This label is really permissive. It allows you to play with the C groups. <laughs> it allows you to create namespaces. It allows you to have way more permissions than you, you actually should be able to do. Uh, but so this is, this is weird. There is something wrong here. Uh, the same happens with the, the KMU, uh, the VMM process. So let's compare. Like uh, up there, we have ContainerD. Down here, we have Cryo. Uh, we have the same labels being used for the Kata Shin, for the Kata Runtime. But we have those different labels being used for for the Virtio FSD and KMU process. Down here is the right ones, up there are the way more permissive ones that we don't want. So I started debugging this, like what is going on, right? So the first thing that came to my mind is like, is SLinux like actually enabled on the container this side? This is the configuration that I'm using and here you can see it is enabled. So I didn't miss that part. Does ContainerD actually have support for passing this uh, KVM ContainerD label down to the, to the Kata containers? It does. It was added by Michael Crosby in that commit over there. It was almost a birthday gift for me <laughs> one day before on August 2020. So am I actually running a version of ContainerD that has that patch? I was using uh, 1.5.2, and that is part of 1.5.2. So there must be something fishy with the code. So uh, sorry if this is too small. Uh, this is the best that I could do. But what ContainerD does when it's uh, actually setting up the label? It comes here. It tries to modify, modify the process label. It checks, like, is this process here? Kata containers. If it is, let's just get the KVM label here. That one we'll call this one here. And this one here we'll just get uh, to this function. Well, this function will actually populate all the content from that file. And this one here will check, like, if container KVMT is part of that file over there, customi uh, customizable types, we return that, OK, uh, here is the KVM label. Uh, otherwise, it will just return new, which means that it will be running with the same label as the parent process. And you can see that as it's running, as it was running with the container uh, runtime T, it's exactly the same label as the parent process. So let's take a look at that file that it's actually using. 
If we open that file, we don't see the container KVMT label there. It's just not there. So what do we know? We know that uh, ContainerD searches for a label in a file where the label is not there. This label, though, is present in another file called uh, in US Airshare containers as a Linux context. Those are two different projects. Those are two different packages. Uh, the first one over there comes from the SA Linux policy targeted package from, from your distro. The second one comes from the container SA Linux process, uh, policy and, and package. So how do we fix that? What shall we do to fix that? <laughs> Just remove a bunch of code. <laughs> Best way, right? Uh, what I'm doing here is I actually Instead of doing this whole dance to get the label or not, I just rely on the SA Linux library because that library actually knows where to check for, and if, if it's present there, it will just return you the right label. If it's not, it will return you an error. So we just do this, rely on that, and let's see if this works. Same drill as before, right? So container D cluster, uh, same uh, kata containers, uh, nginx pod. Uh, it's running, it was before. Let's see if it's working as it was before. And now let's take a look at the label of the process. Uh, you can see here, Virtio FSD is running, confined by the container KVMT. Same about the KMU process. So now we have the right uh, level of restrictions that we want to have. This uh, was merged as part of the container D1.6.0 beta 5. Fixes there. I backported this to the container D uh, 1.5.9. And cool, container D now has support to this and is working like as it is expected to work. Uh, but we are talking about KMU all the time. I, I work for Intel. I have a really strong interest in having Cloud Hypervisor running everywhere as possible. So, does it work? Again, <laughs> only one way to check it. Same cryo machine, first one. We have like everything setting on to run as enforcing. Here we have the runtime class. Same one as Kimu, but this time like uh, using Cloud Hypervisor as the, the VMM. So uh, we start uh, the pod. And let's take a look. Container creating for four seconds. This, this is fishy. So something is going on here. When we describe the pod, uh, <laughs> we can see that there was an error there. If we take a look whether uh, SA Linux was able to catch something, you can see there was an, an AVC. Uh, don't worry that much about this right now because I have those here. So up there, is the error that happened uh, when trying to start the pod. Down here is the AVC. It basically says, open tap failed because of permission denied. The cloud hypervisor binary, which is running with the container KVMT label, is not able to open a untap device. In my mind, I was like, how is it different from what KMU was doing? Took a look at the Kata Containers code and what KMU actually does, it receives uh, the file descriptors of an open type device. While with Cloud Hypervisor, what we do is we get, we open the, the Tantap device as part of the Kata Shin. We close it and we get, its, we get its, its, its name, pass the name down to Cloud Hypervisor, close it and say, hey, open this for me. And then it's not allowed to do that. Does it have to be fixed on Kata containers or Cloud Hypervisor? Yes. 
so let's go a little bit about how Cloud Hypervisor works. Uh, Cloud Hypervisor is quite neat. Like you, you, when you launch Cloud Hypervisor, it basically starts an HTTP uh, server for you, and then you can talk to, the, to Cloud Hypervisor via a REST API. Uh, then you create DVM, but create DVM just means you pass a configuration, Cloud Hypervisor will use that configuration for a VM whenever the VM is booted. So create VM and boot VM are two different things. Uh, but we have a problem. We have a problem because create VM does not receive, does not have the capability to, the possibility to receive any file descriptor from, for the network device. Uh, but you can do this when you are attaching a new network device. However, it's, it was only possible to do that if the VM is booted up, but like at, attaching a network device when the VM is booted is not the way that cut containers, well, the containers would work in general. Uh, we expect the network to be up when sandbox is created. It would just fail. And then we have a problem that uh, this REST API is provided by this project, well, there's this project called a, uh, Open API that does the bindings. It out-generates code for you, so you can get these definitions, and then you can just like out-generate Go code that we use inside Kata containers. And it has no notion about uh, uh, the socket, socket control messages, so that was hard. So what I did to actually fix this on, on the Cloud Hypervisor side, I talked a lot with uh, Robert uh, Bradford and Sebastian Boff who are the maintainers, and we decided to just allow people to create the VM. It means create the configuration, patch it. If you are trying to hot plug something, you just patch the configuration. You are not starting the VM. It does not require the VM to be up. You just change the configuration. That's fine. And then when the user boots it up, everything is there in place. Uh, this work was done, merged, and this is what we are using on the Cloud Hypervisor side. On the Cloud Container side, though, we had to, to do a few changes because we were getting the network device, we were creating the VM, and then we were booting this up. But we had to postpone, postpone the network addition to after the VM is created, but before the VM is booted because we want to do this change in the config where we can actually pass the file descriptor down to Cloud Hypervisor. And instead of passing the name, we pass the file descriptor. Because if you pass the name, Cloud Hypervisor has the preference for that, and it will just try to open the device by its name. And because of the limitations on Open API, what we had to do was actually taking care of the request by ourselves, because Open API has no notions about sending and receiving sockets. So we just had to do this uh, simple put a request, get the response uh, on our side. And this is a work that is still uh, going, like it's there for, for review, had like some really good feedbacks, and I hope to get this merged next week, and this will be part of the next release. So let me just give you a demo of this running. Uh, you can see, like, same cluster as we had before. Now we are just creating that, uh, the Nginx uh, pod. Same thing as before, using Cloud Hypervisor as the runtime class name. And let's get the pod. Make sure that everything works. This is the pod here. Uh, it works. Now let's take a look at the, the labels. Yay. You can see here, uh, VirtualFSD is running as the container KVMT. Cloud Hypervisor process is running as the container KVMT. Uh, VirtualFSD process, and you can see SA Linux is set as enforcing. So, yay, we have this done. But is this work completed? <laughs> Not only no, but hell no. <laughs> Uh, we are still missing, uh, we have to make sure that this actually works with Kata Deploy. Kata Deploy is a daemon set that we have to ease the deployment of Kata containers and Kubernetes cluster. We have to have Firecracker support added. So changes will be really similar to what we have done for 
uh, cloud hypervisor. Uh, it uses the same like REST VMM crates, but I'm not sure if the community will actually accept the changes. We have to check with them. Uh, Nidus uh, D support, which is another, uh, is a virtual FSD like uh, shared file system solution program. I never tested with that. Should we have a Linux support inside the guest? Maybe. Do we want to have API armor support? Maybe. If someone's interested in working on any of those, I would be really, really happy to mentor. Uh, let me just quickly go through the benefits uh, to the community on this. Uh, now with this, we can actually run uh, everything using, run uh, Kata containers on, on clusters using SA Linux by default, which is basically means like rel and Fedora based Kubernetes cluster. We have like Kubernetes specific distros that are using uh, ContainerD and SA Linux like Fredcar, Runcher, Typhoon, and maybe I really hope that at some point, as part of OpenShift sandbox of containers, we can have a hypervisor that's slightly more tailored to the cloud use case than Kimu. Don't get me wrong, I love Kimu. But if you can have something like more modern that has the right uh, use cases for, I would prefer. So quick recap. Kata containers can run under the container KVMT label. Uh, support for these has been added since uh, 2.0.0, uh, but only for Kimu. Cryo support has been working since the version 119.0. Containerd patch was merged for 1.6.0, backported to 1.5.9. Cloud hypervisor support has been there since uh, 22.0. Uh, Kata containers changes for cloud hypervisor will be merged hopefully next week and will be part of the next release. It's going to help us to expand where we can easily run Kata containers. And if someone's interested in doing some work on this, I'm happy to mentor. And that's it. Thanks a lot. And I over my time for two minutes. Thanks.